Hey everybody, Tony Federico here, and I wanted to personally welcome you to the very first YouTube episode of Paleo Magazine Radio. Now I know that YouTube is all about the video, but due to the fickle nature of the internet, it just isn't possible for us to provide full audio and video for all of our podcast interviews. However, we will still do our best. When all else fails, we'll post the audio version of the podcast here on YouTube, enhanced just for you, with images of our guests, their books, projects, and products. We hope you enjoy today's episode, and if you like getting your weekly dose of PMR right here on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to our channel. We also want your feedback, so feel free to let us know what you think right there in the comment section below. So without further ado, Paleo Magazine Radio starts now. Welcome to PMR, Paleo Magazine Radio, where we bring you paleo nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle perspectives from both the experts and the everyday. PMR is brought to you by Paleo Magazine, the first and only print magazine dedicated to the paleo lifestyle and is hosted by Tony Federico. For many people, thinking about food leads to better food choices. But what if your food leads you to thinking? For Jared Stone, author of Year of the Cow, going through an entire grass-fed steer transformed not only his personal health, but the way that he spends time with his family and the way that he considers the food on his plate. In today's podcast, we speak to Jared about his journey cooking his way through an entire cow, experiences with zombie lobsters, and how good food turned into good movement, good human interaction, and a whole slew of other positive changes in his life. In the second half of today's show, I'm going to be speaking with Kane Credicott, Paleo Magazine Editor-in-Chief in another installment of Paleo Magazine Audio Insider. Today's subject, Paleo Fitness, our brand new digital publication that's available now on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon.com. You're not going to want to miss this episode, so go ahead and grab yourself a side of beef and get comfortable. Paleo Magazine Radio starts now. here with Jared Stone. Jared is the author of Year of the Cow, How 420 Pounds of Beef Built a Better Life for One American Family. Jared, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. So let's just go ahead and dive right into it. You ordered an entire grass-fed cow, a steer, and made it your goal to eat your way through it over the course of the year. Can you talk about the initial inception of the idea, how it came into your head to get a whole cow? Sure. Well, I work in television, and basically it occurred to me one day as I was watching a television show about food that I knew more about the television that was actually hanging on my wall, this 1080p HD beast, than the food that actually becomes, you know, me, the actual right. stuff that becomes my physical body. And I thought that was kind of bananas, uh, no pun intended. I thought that was ridiculous. As I thought about that more, I decided that I should, you know, as one does, buy an entire cow and <laughs> learn to make the best use of it uh, over the course of a year, that, what I thought would be a year that I possibly right. could. That might not be the natural response <laughs> for most people. And actually, let me just mention, is that the Rhodesian Ridgeback that you mentioned in your book? That's basil, yes. That's the famous basil. All right, yes. glad, uh, glad she made a cameo. <laughs> yeah, that's her. She's hanging out with me. Nice. So I don't know if most people would naturally choose a cow. Can you explain why maybe that was your particular inclination? Sure. Uh, well, there's several reasons. One, I come from Kansas originally. Mm. Uh, I kind of grew up visiting, for example, Abilene, which is the end of the cattle trails there that started in Texas. And so, the you know, the cattle world and the world of the high plains was always kind of present with me. And so I thought for somebody like me, that would be a good place to start. But also I wanted to start with a steer because that's a big animal. Yeah. And, you know, beef is kind of our national dish in a lot of ways. Right. And, you know, American identity is tied to beef in a way that it's tied to a few other foods. Apple pie, maybe. Yeah, you got the cowboys, you got the West, you know, the cattle drives. One could argue that we have forged our national identity on the myth of the West and of the cowboy and, and you know, that you can't have a cowboy without a cow. Right. And so I wanted to explore that as well. Chicken and pig boy doesn't sound, it doesn't have the same ring. Doesn't work, right? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, just doesn't work at all. Yeah, no, I'm with you. So. And why a grass-fed steer? You, you described in the book The Orchard, uh, I guess you could say, where this cow came from. And it, and it was really kind of a cool process. 
wherein the cow was part of an ecological system that avoided the use of pesticides and herbicides and things like that. Yeah, no, it was a remarkable thing. I was sitting there in my living room and I was like, you know, I'm going to, I should get a steer and like cook my way through the entirety of the steer. So naturally I started researching, you know, what steer should I get? What's the best way to feed my family? Am I doing it, you know, currently the best way? And I kind of, as I looked into steers, I started learning the difference in the way steers are produced. So you have basically grass fed steer and grain fed steer. So in most of the beef that's produced in the United States, they are produced in a grain fed system, otherwise known as a CAFO, you know, concentrated right. animal feeding operation. Operation. And so you have these feedlots, which is where you send these calves off, you know, after, after the cow-calf operation, they ship off to a feedlot and they're fed on a steady diet of surplus corn. Now, what happens there is it brings them up to market weight very, very quickly. But the corn has all sorts of incidental vi environmental costs as well, because you have to have a guy to produce it. You have to sure. have pesticides that are, you know, derived from fossil fuels to make it. You have fertilizers and tractors and all this sort of thing, not to mention trucking it in. And that's part of the reason it has such a high petroleum footprint print, for example. Yeah, a lot of inputs. Yeah, a lot of inputs. And so when I looked into it, there were also these ranchers out there, not very many of them, uh, but they were making grass fed steer because steer are actually built anatomically to feed on grass. So instead of bringing yeah. in all this food that is fit for human consumption, right, this, all this corn and stuff that you could be feeding the humans, they instead of doing that, they let the cattle walk around and eat the lawn you know, humans can't process grass. So what you're doing is you're turning a non food resource into a food resource. That's kind of the magic of a cow, I guess, in the first place, maybe why we domesticated them originally. Absolutely. Absolutely. It turned, you know, a field into a protein source. And so the place I went to was a ranch called Chafin Family Orchards in Oroville, California. I found them on eatwild.com, which I always say nice things about because it's a, Eat Wild is a great resource, yes. as I'm sure many of your listeners know, to find pasture and, and uh, sustainably raised livestock. Sure. And it turns out, and this blew my mind when I discovered it, is they don't actually raise grass-fed cattle in order to sell beef per se. They raise grass-fed beef in order to raise better stone fruits and orchard crops. Because it turns out when you have orchards and they have, a, you know, I don't remember how many acres they have, but they have thousands of acres. They have an enormous orchard there. So it's a pretty big operation. It's not like just a guy with a no, cow in his backyard. It's and an enormous tree. operation, and it's all orchard land. So what they have is all these orchards, and they raise a lot of stone fruit. They raise a lot of olives. They have some of the oldest olive trees in California. Oh, wow. And so what they do is when you raise these orchards, you have to have a guy go through with a tractor between the trees and mow the grass and the shrubs down so that they don't grow up and choke out the trees, right? So that's hiring a guy, that's getting a tractor, that's a capital outlay, it's a petroleum outlay, it's, yep. you know, it's all this sort of stuff to have this guy run through and mow. Instead of doing that, this particular organization, Chafin, they actually send through cattle to eat all the grass between the trees. Mm. So the cattle go in and eat all the grass and in doing so fertilize the soil simultaneously and, and you know, and then work that manure into the soil by the action of their hooves. And then, yeah. and, you know, it's generally good for the land. Then right. after they send through the cattle, they send through goats. So the goats come through and eat the shrubbery and the woody stuff that the cattle wouldn't touch because cattle are mostly interested in yeah. grass. And they further fertilize the uh, soil and they trim the trees and all that by because they eat, they'll eat anything, you know, that's woody that they can kind of reach. And then after that, and this is where it gets really crazy, is that they send through mobile chicken coops and the chickens come out oh, and wow. eat the bugs that have hatched from the manure from the previous two animals that have come through. So sure. instead of paying a guy to run through and mow and have a tractor and you know burn fossil fuels and everything, they send through three different animals. So they work with nature instead of against nature and they get three further crops from that, grass-fed beef, goat meat, and free-range eggs from the chickens who've been running around and lay their eggs on this in this mobile chicken coop. And as a result, it, it yeah. increases the health of the soil and the health of their orchard as well, and it winds up being a really beneficial relationship for everybody involved. That's amazing. It sounds like that is what biotechnology really should be, right. not genetically modifying things. Let's use nature to support nature, and then and we win, and, and the world wins, and everybody wins. Well, it's remarkable because all of these agricultural pursuits exist in an ecosystem. And by recognizing sure. that, you can use actual animals to perform the tasks they would have in that ecosystem, like ruminants to eat grass and yeah. goats to eat shrubbery and stuff like that, instead of having to mechanically or chemically mimic their role in the ecosystem by adding fertilizers or by you know sending somebody through to physically Basically trim everything. It just makes a whole lot of sense. Because there's a lot of costs, obviously, like you mentioned, the petroleum based chemicals, the, the yeah. pollution, the safety of the humans out there doing all those things that can be done. Sure. 
if you're just willing to maybe be a little bit uh, creative and and maybe a little bit more respectful of nature. That's awesome. That's true. So that's where your cow came from. Correct. You had to drive it home. I think you uh, mentioned packing your car full of meat and desperately trying to get it back before it <laughs> defrosted. Yeah. Can you talk about the uh, logistics of transporting 420 pounds of beef? Well, I live in L.A. and Oroville is about nine hours away. Oh. So we it <laughs> so was it's not right down the road. <laughs> no, it's a gigantic distance. It's almost the length of California for me. Yeah. So what we had to do was I wanted to videotape the entire process and learn as much as I could since I'm going out of my way to make the best use of this animal that I possibly can. I want to learn its backstory, right? I want to sure. learn where it comes from. I want to kind of do an ethnography of the grass-fed steer. Mm -hmm. And so I recorded the entire farm tour, uh, and it turns out one grass-fed steer is approximately one Prius full of beef. Um, nice. If you have a Toyota Prius, it fits a cow just about perfectly. So we drove up there. We met our rancher, Chris, who showed us around the place, answered all our questions, very patient with us. And then we spent the night and drove back in the morning. So we had nine hours, and in our car was me, my friend who was taping, who was uh, shooting the whole thing, an audio kit, two pounds of nectarines, a frozen chicken, and an entire grass-fed steer. And all of that was in nice. our Prius. Was it bottoming out? I mean, how much? Yeah, <laughs> it's almost a quarter ton of beef, plus wow. two dudes and all the other stuff I mentioned. So it was a lot of beef. So we, it was June, so we jacked the air conditioner all the way down to max cold and put big thermal blankets on top of all of the meat and, oh, and drove really, really fast in our ersatz meat wagon and tried to make L.A. by sundown. I, I'm surprised we didn't get stopped by the cops. What would we say? We've got yeah. a frozen cow on our back and we're trying to get hit L.A. before sundown. I mean, it, it, wow. that would be our excuse. But um, thankfully— and I didn't know this at the time, but that stuff is – when it's frozen, it is frozen. It is very, yeah. very solidly frozen. So by the time we got back, it was still hard as bricks. We had no cool. thawing at all. Uh, we spent some time trying to get it into the freezer. So you buy a freezer, right? And you, sure. you have like some semblance of how much space this entire steer is going such to take Such and up. such cubic feet. You kind of Correct. 14.7 cubic feet. We had done the math. Math is what makes this not insane. And so <laughs> when we brought it home – uh, we were trying very hard to put it into the thing, and it just wouldn't fit. Mm. And it took us actually several hours to get this all to fit in the freezer, which sounds kind of trivial. But you have to understand, this is a quarter ton of yeah. beef we're working with. So if you pack and repack that and pack and repack that four times, for example, we packed a ton of beef lifting these frozen cube, literally you know, regularly shaped things. Yes, literally a ton of beef because we've had to do it four times. And also, if you make an error on the size of your freezer, mm. it sounds like, well, it's not that big a deal. But like, say you misjudge the space needed to contain this steer by 10%, right? So if you misjudge 10% uh, on a five-pound roast or something like that, oh, I've got an extra half pound that I sure. need to put somewhere. If you misjudge by 10% on 420 pounds of beef, you have 42 pounds that needs to find a home somewhere else in your house. Yeah. Yeah, tensions were running high that day. But eventually we played a pretty fierce game of beef Tetris. Nice. Uh, and we managed to get it all back in. They say video games don't serve any purpose. There right? you go. Right? Playing Absolutely. Tetris, it paid off. Legacy of my misspent you. <laughs> so once you got the beef ready to go, packed away, your, your Prius survived the trip. What was the next step? You're going to start cooking this for your family. What were your ideas as far as how you're going to utilize this meat? Sure. Well, the goal here was to tell the story of this steer and make the best use of this animal that I possibly could. So every cut of beef we did, we looked at the cut and we said, okay, what does this cut do anatomically on the animal? Well, right. okay, this is a chuck roast, so it comes off the, the shoulder or the, or the upper leg of the animal, and it does a lot of walking around. So as a result, it's going to develop a lot of connective tissue. So we, we looked at what it did anatomically and how that translated culinarily. So if you have all this connective tissue from a culinary standpoint, connective tissue comes in two types, elastin and collagen, and you have to cut out the elastin because elastin just doesn't do anything. Mm. And then collagen, you have to either cut that away mechanically or shorten it mechanically, or you have to deal with it chemically and turn it into uh, and melt it into gelatin through a braise, which makes sauces lovely and beautiful. So we did this process for every single cut so we try to figure out what's the chuck roastiest thing i can do with this chuck roast yeah the ultimate expression of a correct of a chuck the roast that's a beautiful way to put it the ultimate expression of this particular cut of meat and in each cut we tried to make that ultimate expression shine mm. as best yeah. we could um and it was quite an education and you know i was always a pretty good cook but you know when you have a whole steer you learn what you don't know very quickly and you fill in, the, in those gaps in your knowledge uh, with a quickness yeah you learn the hard way you do. You mentioned the chuck roast, lots of connective tissue, sure. more suitable for, for braising. What sure. about some of the other cuts? What are the best way to utilize some other pieces of beef based on their properties? 
Yeah, sure. So basically the stuff that's in the middle of the animal is the stuff that's going to be fairly easy to wrangle. So the stuff that comes off the rib primal, off the off the short line, all the stuff that's at the top of the animal, far from the head and the hoof, that's mm. the stuff that doesn't have a lot of connective tissue. And as a result, those are the really expensive cuts in the grocery store. Those are the stuff that people think of as sexy, yeah. you know, cuts of meat. So you've got your ribeyes, you've got your strips, you've got your, uh, t- your, your New York strips, you've got your tenderloins up in there and your T-bones and that sort of stuff. Uh, is pretty easily cooked hot and fast. But there's not a whole Hmm. lot of that stuff, relatively speaking. Uh, A big chunk of the animal comes in those chuck roasts because there's, you know, it's the front leg and shoulder. And then you've got the round, which is the back leg and shoulder. And that's a whole lot of stuff. And that's a whole lot of stuff that a lot of people don't necessarily see in the grocery store. It's definitely not some of the most popular cuts. And so dealing with that connective tissue became, you know, a primary concern. I got really good at braises. There's a ton of things to braise on that animal, and and you can change the character of the braise in a lot of different ways based upon how you treat it and how you and the the, the liquid you use in the braise and stuff like that. Um, I did a, a fair bit of barbecue, for example, nice. on the brisket, which is a whole other world in and of itself because there you know everybody has an opinion in the barbecue world of how sure. to do a brisket. Yeah, every year there's a big uh, paleo convention in Austin, Texas. So uh, well acquainted with the Texas style beef brisket. I'm sure as someone from Kansas City, uh, you you're aware of other ways of doing things. The burnt ends are uh, Harold from that area. I'm going to risk my, my people back in Kansas, but the Texans do this brisket ah. right. And they and they do it with like either a mop yep. sauce or a really, really thin sauce. And that's the right. way to do it. That's some glorious stuff. Kansas City is kind of a crossroads sure. of the barbecue world. And so they get a lot of influences, both from Carolina and then St. Louis and then from Texas as well. But I got to say, I have a real fondness for the Texas naked brisket, maybe a little bit of mop sauce mm-hmm. just done done right. over, you know, over hickory or mesquite and done beautifully. Yeah. But my, my people back in Kansas City with their burn ends, uh, if you're ever in Kansas City, uh, you need to order the burn ends because they do it like nobody else. And I yeah. can't say enough good things about them. I have not been to Kansas City. If I go, burn ends are, are certainly going to be on the menu. Yeah, now, it wasn't yeah. all about beef, though. You had some other sort of experiences around food because this kind of got you thinking about not just where does my beef come from and its role in my, my sustenance, but other things like the vegetable component. So sure. joining a CSA and then there's the whole zombie lobster experience. Do you mind talking about some of the other foods that sort of circled into this food experiment? Of course. When you bring home an entire grass-fed steer, that is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful piece of meat. It's artisan cow. Correct. Correct. People who are into grass-fed beef, myself included, refer to it in terms of like terroir, right. where we, we, they use language of wine connoisseurs yeah. uh, to describe the the because you can really taste where that meat came from. And some people, perhaps with a better palate than me, can taste like mm, this steer ate clover, this steer mm-hmm. ate mostly Bermuda, you know, whatever the grasses are. I've seen people do that. And that's really that's astonishing cool. to me. A beef sommelier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I discovered uh, what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. But what I discovered is that beef, when you have a whole steer in your freezer, that beef casts mm. a long shadow. And so it really cast into stark relief all the other food that was in my life and the other food that I ate. And maybe that food sure. wasn't the best quality that I could have eaten. So if you serve you know, some bad corn-based uh, instant potatoes, for example, along with your gorgeous, beautifully braised grass-fed beef, you can yep. tell the starkness of the contrast. And so when I was paying attention to what kind of beef I was eating, it naturally made me pay attention to what else I was eating. Uh, and it turned mm. out I was eating a lot of crap. Uh, so I started cutting out that crap and I started paying attention more to my diet and more to my health. Uh, I discovered the paleo community. Uh, I recognized that I'm eating way too many cereal grains and <laughs> I cut out refined sugar, whole, whole cloth, uh, cut out cereal grains, uh, started eating more vegetation than a boatload of Buddhists. When we started cooking the steer, we realized that people used to cook as in doing the research for this, right. people used to cook a lot more than they do now. People used to be a lot more conversant, uh, with sure. kitchen techniques and with how to do stuff in the kitchen than they are now. And so I, when I started looking back at how people used to cook and how people used mm. to eat, I discovered a world of vegetables that I'd never really encountered before. So when I subscribed to my CSA, I was like, what is this big white giant carrot looking thing? And, you know, I had to Google it and figure out stuff. And like, I was like, oh, that's a turnip or that's a, that's a rutabaga. Yeah. Okay. So what do I do with a rutabaga? What do I do with a parsnip? What do I do with turnips? I mean, this is stuff that I'd never really wrangled before. The colors on my plate 
looked like a friggin' rainbow because I had so many purples and reds and oranges and greens on there that I'd never had before. And I started noticing changes in my health and I started feeling a lot better. My energy levels shot through the roof. Uh, I stopped getting hypoglycemic peaks and valleys in my mood all day. I evened out there. Hell, I dropped 20 pounds. Wow. But as a result of getting this beautiful grass-fed steer, I learned what was wrong with the rest of my diet. And I managed to make changes there, and my health dramatically improved as a result. And apply the same philosophy and focus on ingredient quality and, and sourcing as you did with the beef, and then obviously magnified the positive impacts that you were experiencing. Yeah, and this looking back at how things used to be, about how people sure. used to treat their food and treat their environment, or, well, maybe perhaps, well, it became like a mania, all mm -hmm. right? So everything that happened to me, I was like, okay, well, how did people used to do this? Um, so people don't really cook that much anymore. How did people used to cook? Well, it turns out that, you know, a lot of the processed food craze came about after World War II when you had all these companies that had manufactured K rations for the war, and so they made, uh, you know, military rations, and then they had the, all this infrastructure built up, and they had to find some way to right. sell their K rations or modified K rations to a civilian marketplace. And so that's how you come up with TV dinners and airline food and all sorts of wildly processed stuff that are fairly recent in our culinary landscape. People like to talk about cake mixes as emblematic of the process, whereas once upon a time, people used to know how to make a cake from scratch, and home ec classes in school would teach people how to make homemade cakes. And then as a while, you know, when the companies that came after World War II started trying to sell cake mixes to housewives uh, who were doing the cooking at the time, um, they had to invent this ticking clock because the cake mixes that they were producing did not produce cakes of a quality that you could make when you cooked at home using real ingredients, right? Kind of creating that sense of urgency, right. that, that whole idea that we needed more convenient options to quickly get food on the table. Otherwise, you know, we're, I don't know, I don't know, they're just kind of selling us on fear, really. It's a completely fabricated ticking clock. And so once I kind of in the research for this book, I recognized that. I was like, if I'm racing through this process of making dinner for my family, what am I saving that time for? Is there something else I'd rather be doing in my day than making dinner for my family and enjoying that meal together? Yeah. So what am I going to what am I going to do after that? So so why don't I not rush through this? Why don't I make the actual food? And why don't I you start with fresh whole ingredients and, and do my best, you know, as much as my culinary skills will allow to make that meal, to loop the family into the to the process, right. to make stuff with my kids. Um, and it really made me rethink my priorities. That ticking clock is a myth. Absolutely. And then going beyond the food and into some of the other things that you started to experience, you kind of went down the paleo wormhole. I think your first introduction you mentioned in the book was uh, the Western A. Price um, nourishing yeah. traditions. And then uh, you started to look into some barefoot running and, and it kind of just kept spiraling out. Can you talk a little bit about how it, it became all encompassing in some ways? Of course, yeah. So as as you look back into how things used to cook, I'm, when I, my rancher suggested I check out uh, Weston A. Price mm. Foundation, so I picked up Sally Fallon's book, and uh, Nourishing Traditions. Right. And yeah, when you look at that, you see how people who ate a pre-Western diet had you know gigantic health benefits over over the people who had adopted an industrialized Westernized diet. And so I started looking at well, that's certainly interesting. Uh, and I started making more foods that incorporated more yeah. healthy fats. Uh, and more whole ingredients. And then as I started looking at that, I started looking into running because I was like, I was starting to feel better and I wanted to get back into running. I used to be a runner and I had stopped, uh, ironically, because I, I ran a marathon. And when you run a marathon, that becomes a fantastic rationale for not running because mm. I was like, oh, I ran a marathon last week. I don't have to run a marathon today. I've earned myself some free time. You've been to the mountaintop. There's nothing else to do. And then that <laughs> persisted for like years. Nice. <laughs> I, I got like, all my running on that one day when I ran I, the marathon. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> so I was like, I can't, I can't justify this anymore. So I started looking into running, but because I still had those shoes from my marathon days, I was, they were blown to bits. Right. They were just trashed. So I started looking into, you know, because I had this mania now. How did people used to run? And I discovered Dan Lieberman at Harvard, Professor Lieberman's research about uh, barefoot running. It made a ton of sense. So I started experimenting with barefoot running and I quickly realized the difference, you know, what having a half inch of space age polymers on your heel allows you to do in a runner stride. At the same time, Barefoot yeah. running was crazy fun. I mean, it's just a blast to get out there, you know, unshod. I felt like gravity was merely a suggestion. I felt like I, I felt lighter and freer than I'd ever run before instead of my 
plotting, galumphing down the thing. The Clydesdale sort yeah. of uh, strategy. All of a sudden, I'm springy and I can like jump up on right. stuff and over stuff. And I'm not saying that I did that, but I did that. Um, <laughs> no, I totally did. I made an ass of myself and jumped over stuff that I didn't. I mean, I was like, I was like the world's worst self-trained parkour guy there for a couple of weeks when I was first nice. starting to barefoot run. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I st- had to kind of retrain my stride because exactly. I was heel striking. Sure, your calves were uh, blown out after that yeah, first run. Yeah, but um, <laughs> so I had to re- rethink my stride and really focus on forefoot striking and you know smaller, faster steps. But I've really grown to enjoy it, and you know. Running is always going to benefit your health, and uh, I, I'm really glad I got back into that. I never expected I would start to barefoot run based upon buying a grass-fed steer. I mean, those two things do not commute, but when you start to, as you said, go down the rabbit hole, they all start to come together. All paths lead back to the cow. Now, <laughs> I, I mentioned briefly the zombie lobster. We, we only have a few more minutes. Yes. So I definitely wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of recount that experience. I thought it was one of the funnier moments in your book. Oh, thank um, you. Where did surf and turf go so wrong? So when you've got an entire steer in your backyard, you can make anything you want. And so I decided that I was like, you know what? I'm going to make surf and turf. It's kind of a joke of a meal because it's so ostentatious. And those, it's like a lobster and yeah. a tenderloin. And those don't even really go together, right? It was just an excuse for the most expensive things on the menu to go together in a restaurant. But I was like, that's okay. I've got the whole tenderloin. We're going to do this. So I've never cooked a lobster. Uh, and I, I so you was, went out, you found a live lobster. I found a live time. lobster. Yep. You wanted to do it right. I did. I did. <laughs> and I brought it home, scared the hell out of the kid, scared the dog, scared the wife. This thing, you know, it's like something from the Cretaceous period. And, <laughs> um, so I, I had to kill this thing and I was trying to be as conscientious as I could. Yeah. And I read up on all the methods to do it. One method said to put them in the freezer for two hours. One said one hour is plenty. One said 20 minutes is fine. One said you don't be a weenie about it. Just do the knife thing through the top of the head. And I was like, okay, so two hours was the most conservative. I'm going to do three hours because I'm going to be sure. super conservative and three hours in the freezer and this lobster will painlessly go to sleep and then I can boil it. And so I put it in the freezer for three hours, longer than I'm supposed to. I come back and I take it out. The lobster's not moving at all. I start to get the other stuff ready, start to do all the other tasks that are associated with the meal. I start pulling, drawing water and get all this stuff right. I see the lobster twitch. And this is okay because, you know, like frog legs kick in the saute pan. It's a reflex. It's just probably a twitchy thing. It's probably not a big deal. But it's creepy, right? Sure. So I reach over and I tap the lobster gently on the shell and it stands up. It's supposed to be dead. Yeah. It's supposed to be like four times dead. And so I like immediately shove it back in the freezer. So the lobster's pissed. He's not dead. Yeah, he's still alive. <laughs> I put him back in there for another whole hour, which should be way plenty of time. Sure. And then I finally bring him back out there. And, you know, my instructions for this lobster say to wash it briefly in cold water. So I turn on the water and I start running water over this lobster. And no exaggeration, it takes off its arm and chucks it at me. It throws its arm at me. And then there's a little click, and its entire arm goes boom, 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 and falls to the sink. And I, and I jumped, and I'm like, what is going on with this lobster? Just to, to give me a visualization, was it like claw grabbed claw? threw it at you yeah it didn't like use tools and like it and like and like grab itself and like beat you, you know it didn't grab its claw and no. beat you with its uh, okay and this thing by all accounts is supposed to be as dead as dead can be it's not, not supposed to be things. interacting with me at all right <laughs> and so i'm yeah. cold water i'm rinsing cold water here and then there's it gives a little shudder and there, i hear a click and this arm just goes blah, 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 and falls on and i had my hand under it like because i was kind of trying to brush some stuff off it falls down onto my wrist and just and i'm like did, my first thought was did it rot and I immediately like jump back and put the lobster down. You definitely didn't scream. Oh, I'm sure I made some scream. noises. I made <laughs> I made some noises. And so I, I run to the computer and they're like, yeah, lobsters will occasionally detach their claws as a defensive oh, mechanism. So this lobster is not only alive, it's pissed off and it's mad at me. He's throwing down. He's, yeah. he's like he's so mad at me that he's flinging his appendages at me in an attempt to, to make my life hell. So I was like, this is look, I'm dragging this out. I need to just do what needs to be done here. So I so a water hot lobster claw and then like I garlic over the doorway and then like I, you know, lit a candle to some pagan saint. I don't know. I, I made all the occult things that I could do <laughs> because this thing was coming back from the dead. 
Um, he's like a horror movie villain that just keeps yeah. coming back and coming back. Yeah, yeah. And I put like a, a like a rock on the lid, and then yeah, it was it was kind of shook his claw at you as he went yeah, down into the water. Yeah, <laughs> it was like that thing at the Terminator where they come back up. Exactly, one time. exactly. It was, it was, I, more, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Next time I would just go straight to the water and not play around with it. Well, you know, I think that the the message there is that going into real food, going into connection with your food. There are going to be surprises, and, and, and maybe one of the things that we've given up is surprise when it comes to what is this going to taste like? Maybe a peach from one area tastes different than a peach from another area. Maybe a cow from California yeah. tastes, tastes different than a cow from Florida. So there's a lot more to our life that opens up when we kind of go down this pathway, including getting a, a cloth thrown at us by a, an angry zombie, zombie lobster. Zombie, um, yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I, I wish you the best of luck with the book. It's a great read. Thank if, you. If people want to find out about you, uh, jaredstonewrites.com. Is that your uh... – mm-hmm. And then, yeah, jaredstonewrites.com. And then you can also find me uh, – my Twitter handle is YOTC for Year of the Cow. So YOTC Jared. And I'm on Facebook at facebook.com slash Year of the Cow. Awesome, man. Well, hey, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, I have a couple chapters left in the end of the book, so I'm, I'm looking forward to being surprised to see how it all turns out. Well, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. That was Jared Stone, author of Year of the Cow, How 420 Pounds of Beef Built a Better Life for One American Family. Since its release, Year of the Cow has been featured on Bon Appetit Magazine's 20 Food Books to Read This Summer list, Los Angeles Magazine's Summer Reading List for Foodies, and Grub Street's 10 New Food Books to Read This Summer. You can find Year of the Cow on Amazon.com or wherever books are sold. Coming up next, Kane Credicott, Editor-in-Chief of Paleo Magazine. For another installment of Paleo Magazine Audio Insider, I'm Tony Federico, and you are listening to PMR. Hey, everybody, we're back for another installment of Paleo Magazine Audio Insider with Editor in Chief of Paleo Magazine, Kane Credicott. Kane, welcome back to the show. Hey, Tony. How's it going? I'm good, man. I'm good. So I was thinking for today we could talk about what's going on. Obviously, the big thing right now is Paleo Fitness Magazine, which we're all very excited about. But I also wanted to kind of introduce people to the location of Paleo Magazine headquarters in case anybody's not familiar with that. It's over on the the northwest side of the United States. So let's start with Paleo Fitness and then we'll get into a little bit about Paleo Magazine HQ and what makes it so special. Uh, so you want to tell us a little bit about some of the new uh, information regarding Paleo Fitness that people can check out? People can actually get it now, which is good. So <laughs> that's, the last a very, few times, that's very good, yes. The, the last few times, you know, we've chatted, it's been like, hey, it's coming. Hey, we're getting there, you know, that kind of thing. And, and now it's actually out there. Um, and I think, you know, you and I were chatting, and I think by the time this thing actually, you know, people actually listening to this, there should be a couple issues available now. Yeah. I would definitely encourage people to, uh, you know, jump on their devices and uh, head on over to um, iTunes or the App Store. Google Play, Amazon, all, that, all those good places. Jump over there and download the app. The app is free, of course, but it's just like any other magazine app, right? App is free, but then if you want to look at anything, you know, you can buy each issue. Go in, check it out, grab an issue. Uh, you can actually check out an issue for free for like two minutes or something awesome. like that. So it gives you the opportunity to kind of scroll through it, see if there's anything that catches your eye, that kind of good stuff. Um, Try before you buy. Before you want to buy it, exactly. So everybody should go check it out. It's bi-monthly, so there's a couple in there, and here in just a few short weeks, there'll be another one in there. But uh, we're excited it's off the ground finally, and and, uh, hope everybody goes to check it out. Yeah, and in terms of content, uh, the issues that we're talking about, it's going to be the May-June issue as well as the July-August issue. Uh, In May-June, we have articles from Ben Greenfield talking about mind hacks. We have Daryl Edwards, the author of Paleo Fitness, which is uh, appropriately named, and it's good that we're having him contribute uh, to our magazine, talking about how you can actually develop Paleo Fitness in addition to some really great recipes, uh, coconut butter energy bites, plantain protein muffins, uh, pumpkin pie post-workout smoothie. And then in the July-August issue, this is going to kind of get into almost like a summer and outdoor workout theme. And we've got information from the guys over at examine.com talking about the truth of fat burners, so fat burning products, whether they work or not. 
how to properly sit and stand with an actual physical therapist who is big into the paleo movement, Chad Walding, as well as some information for the ladies, such as muscle building rules and strong woman training. So I think we've got a lot of really cool content that people are going to be interested in, and I'm excited that they're actually going to be able to dive in. And then, of course, for everybody out there listening, if you do kind of engage in your own paleo fitness program, if you're out there working out in a gym, outside, doing your thing, but with a paleo fitness slant, make sure you use the hashtag paleo fitness army so that we can feature you in the magazine. That's something that we're going to be doing, uh, giving shout outs uh, to your Instagram and Twitter for posting cool pics of how you get your paleo fitness on. So speaking of which, I've seen uh, some pictures of some stand-up paddle boarding and some other things that I suspect come from your neck of the woods. Can you tell us a little bit about where Paleo Magazine is located and, and what makes it so special and why you choose to be there? I just think that that's something that will might that, that might help people understand kind of the spirit of Paleo Magazine. Sure. Paleo Magazine, we're, we're located here in uh, beautiful Bend, Oregon, which is pretty much smack dab in the middle of the state. And we're in the high desert, right? So a lot of people think the Northwest and they think, you know, rain and it's cloudy and it's just kind of crappy and everything. Right. Kind of um, like Portland and, is, is sort yeah. of what comes to mind. Yeah. I kind of, yeah. Seattle, Portland, dreary, rainy kind of stuff, <laughs> which exactly, you know, is exactly what it's like, but it's like that over there. And so we're east of the Cascade Mountains. So those wonderful mountains keep all that crap over there for the most part. <laughs> Stays uh, on the other side of the mountains. Yeah, it's very dry here. And so, you know, I've been here for maybe 20 years now or something, but I'm from New England originally and I've traveled all over the U.S., especially in fall time. I really like New England and everything. It's beautiful there. But every time that we leave Bend and we think, you know, maybe we should go somewhere else. Maybe we could relocate somewhere else. You know, there's a lot of cool places, right? Like Paleo FX not too long ago was in Austin and Austin's a pretty cool place and all this. But, you know, every time we go away and we come back, we realize how cool Bend is. I mean, it's it's dry um, and I, I can't stand the humidity now anymore. I, I, I prefer the dry. You were commenting on that when we were in uh, in Austin this past oh, uh, Paleo FX. And I was like, dude, yes. I'm from Florida. This is Austin feels dry to me. <laughs> So. No. Oh, my God, no. <laughs> as soon as I stepped off the plane in Austin, I was complaining about the humidity. It was just it, – it's horrible. And it's <laughs> it's super dry here. We're in high desert, so it's very dry. But, you know, it's not like deserty desert, right? I mean, there's obviously there's, – there's trees and there's lakes and there's all this kind of stuff. But the air is just really dry, which is nice. And, you know, Bend is a it's, – it's a beautiful place to live. It's sunny 300 days a year um, or more. It's warm. It's not too cold. It's it's perfect for being outside and, and Bend especially, you know, it's kind of a hubbub or a hubbub, a uh, uh, a hub, I guess, a hub of, of there's all a hub things. and there's a hubbub. Hubbub, yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, it's just a perfect location for outdoor kind of stuff, right? I mean, there's skiing and there's golfing, you know, the basic kind of stuff like that. But then they have you know the tough mudder type stuff. They've got bike races and foot races and they've got CrossFit things going on. I mean, there's stuff going on constantly. Whether you want to get into that stuff or you want to do more traditional stuff like you know. Like I mentioned, like the golf or the ski, or you want to do uh, fishing and hunting, you know, all those things. All, the whole spectrum of outdoor activities happens in Bend. And generally, at, at least once a year, there's a major event going on for one of those things. It's the perfect spot. Like you mentioned, paddle boarding and stuff. I mean, the, right, the, right. not too far from our offices, you know, the river runs right through Bend. And when it gets warm, when it gets nice out, it doesn't even have to be super warm, but when it gets nice out, that place is packed with people floating the river or paddling or kayaking or doing whatever. But one of the coolest things about Bend is you can tell it's a nice day, especially if we've had like a day or two of clouds and then you get that nice day, everybody's outside again immediately. Oh, Living it's it awesome. up. Yes. That sounds and, great, man. Uh, and then we've got a bunch of, you know, food wise, you know, there's farmers markets, there's farms, there's people doing cool things, pastured raised animals and, and trying sustainable practices and all those different things. Everybody's experimenting with that stuff here. And, you know, there's great producers. You had mentioned uh, Gem Foods. They're here. Yeah. You know, and I was going to say that, you know, as far as the paleo centric businesses or the businesses that align well with the paleo movement, uh, there certainly are quite a few in Ben. I've, I've talked to some of the founders, you know, the Gem Raw Organic and uh, Hum Kombucha. And I'm sure there's other ones. What kind of paleo businesses and activities are going on in town? You know, it's it's funny if you think paleo specific type stuff. Even in Bend, there's not an overabundance. 
there's probably more going on in larger cities than there is in Bend. Hmm. If you don't think of paleo specific, if you're looking at people that are looking at how they farm or how they raise their animals, right, right, right. those kinds of things, there's a ton of activity in Bend as far as the local vore type movement, right? So that would be under the more local type thing. But however, that totally applies to paleo as well. Exactly. And I think that that's kind of the bigger picture thing. If they have paleo on the label or paleo on the on the board outside of the business, yeah, that's great that they're getting the, the word out about paleo specifically. But I think the spirit of paleo is is perhaps the most important piece of the puzzle. Oh, yeah. And that's everywhere. I mean, it's um, even like there's some restaurants, right? We're not talking anything like, you know, the caveman card or any of those kinds of very specific menus and stuff like that. Sure. Just more of a general restaurant that are very much into, you know, they're cooking things, duck fat and they're oh, using that things that they're fat. buying seasonally. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. So that's what we like about it is no matter what you're doing in the paleo sphere, there's someone in bend doing something that is very similar and it's very difficult to do something in bend and walk around and have somebody be like, well, that's weird, <laughs> you know, or what's that guy doing? Pretty or, or, open you know, and, yeah. and progressive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's very easy. You know, when you go to a restaurant, like I said, you go somewhere like that and you ask for something, whether it's gluten free or paleo or like I said, the duck fat or tallow or anything, you're not going to get people looking at you cross-eyed, right? Nice. I mean, people are just like, you know, they're, they're totally into it. I mean, it's, it's so, like I said, I, I've been fortunate enough to be over just about every state at least once. Um, in the U.S. and I, I have yet to find a place that is good enough to make us move. I mean, this is a pretty sweet location, and would definitely encourage anyone. You know, if they have the opportunity to come to to Oregon, make a pilgrimage. Definitely check out Bend for sure, <laughs> for sure. Yep. Hey, yep. man, it was definitely on my list of things to do, and uh, I'll take your vote of confidence as as proof <laughs> that uh, there's nothing better than Bend, and uh, and that might be no. a, a good slogan. <laughs> no, no, they can no, they hey, can use that. <laughs> hey, you, you've got good weather in Florida and stuff, right? I mean, it's warm, it's nice, but it's humid, man. It's, oh, it's, it's like 100. percent it Yeah, it's it's horrible. I mean, I, I you can hate... squeeze water out of the air with your bare hands. <laughs> no, no, thank you. No, I, I much prefer the dryness, you know, so when it's 80, it feels like 80, not 110 or whatever it's going to feel like, you know. Yeah, hey, man, well, while I sit here in the swamp, you enjoy the, the high <laughs> desert. Um, thanks again for coming on the show, man. And for everybody out there listening, we'd love to hear your response to our new publication, Paleo Fitness. So hit us up on Twitter, on social media. Use that hashtag Paleo Fitness Army. Uh, thanks again, man, for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Tony. We'll talk to you next time. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for today's episode. Coming up next time on the podcast, Katie Bowman, author of Move Your DNA. Katie is a biomechanist who studied the cellular effects of exercise. It's really mind-blowing stuff, and she does a great job of explaining these high-level concepts in easy-to-understand terms. Here's just a small sample of what's coming up on next week's show. I imagine that a lot of people listening to this um, wear minimal shoes, but... But say you've been wearing a positive heeled shoes for decades before you transition to a minimal shoe. There's a structural adaptation within your body that geometrically prevents some of your cells from participating in your walk. Even though your whole body is going across the ground, even though I can graph that out biomechanically, what's, not, what's missing from that graph are the clumps of cells that continue to be sedentary, even though the whole body could be plotted as active. If you thought that was intriguing, you're definitely going to have to check out the full episode on next week's Paleo Magazine radio podcast. To make sure that that happens, be sure to subscribe through iTunes, make it a, one of your favorites on Stitcher. Doing that is going to ensure that it goes automatically to your phone, your iPad, whatever you use to listen to your podcast automatically you don't even have to mess with it it's just going to pop right in there all on its own and while you're at it please subscribe to our youtube channel we're going to be posting videos of as many podcasts as we can on there so for example in today's episode i mentioned jared stone's dog if you want to actually see the dog basil walking on camera you're going to have to tune into the youtube channel that's just youtube.com backslash user backslash paleo magazine until next time, I'm Tony Federico, and on behalf of everyone at Paleo Magazine, thank you for listening. If you would like to share your story on PMR, please visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash paleomagazine. 
For full transcripts of the show, as well as exclusive online content, go to our webpage, paleomagonline.com. You can also talk to us on Twitter at hashtag PM Radio. 